Episode 28 of Liam Small Abridges A History of Newfoundland by D.W. Prowse, 15 to 20 pages at a time, every day or every other day until the bar is open, depending on how I feel on that particular day. Okay, episode 28. Uh, we're going to start chapter... 16, the reign of Queen Victoria, which I don't really know why we have a separate chapter for that, because the last chapter was also the reign of Queen Victoria. We had a chapter that was over 100 pages long for the 60 years that old George was in power, but for this particular queen, there's lots going on, I suppose, so we're just going to put her right through the mid-1800s. Fuck my life. Okay, um, last going off, we were just finishing... Uh, the other chapter, um, bitching between the English and the French, and then we move right past that to something else. Uh, so in the reign of Queen Victoria, we have a few important dates. 1861, uh, H.W. Hoyles becomes the premier. Political riots in St. John's, Harbor Grace, and Harbor, Maine. P maybe the only interesting thing we're going to talk about today. Uh, 1862, great distress owing to bad fisheries. Steamers used in the seal fishery for the first time. Can't keep this fucking thing lit. Um, 1864, Sir A. Musgrave was the governor. Confederation of the Dominion of Canada. Uh, copper mining commenced at Tilt Cove. The Currency Act is confirmed. 1866, the second Atlantic cable uh, for telegraph successfully landed at Heart's Content. 1867, the fishery was very successful. The British uh, North America Act for Confederation of the provinces is passed. The Dominion of Canada is proclaimed. Uh, 1869, Sir Stephen Hill appointed governor. General elections, Confederation candidates defeated, census taken, poor Dr. Moloch passes away. He's been the star of the show for the last little while. 1870, Honorable C.F. Bennett becomes the premier. I'm skipping dates and here, there's a pile of them. Um, 1873, direct steam to England by Alan Lyne commenced. General election, Bennett government defeated. Uh, 1874, the largest cod fishery ever known in Newfoundland. That's a good year, I suppose. Um... Carter becomes the premier, the Royal Commission, Sir B. Robinson, J. Goodfellow, and J. Fox, Esquires. Uh, 1875, the first government railway survey under the direction of Stanford Fleming, a civil engineer. Good, probably better to be a civil engineer than other stuff, like a merchant or a politician. Um, 1878, Sir V. W. Whiteway became premier. Uh, 1881, serious disturbance on the railway line, the Battle of Fox Trap. Sir Henry Fitz... Hardinge? Fitz Hardinge? Maxi, Governor? Oh, Maxi Street. Man, I'm starting to pick off all these streets. Um, uh, first railway is con uh, under construction in Newfoundland from St. John's to Harbour Grace. Skip, skip, skip. 1886, the report of Joint Committee on Fishery in question. Placentia Railway is commenced. Uh, Sir F.B.T. Carter is the administrator. Sir G.W. There's so many changes of title between uh, justices, um, chief justices, Supreme Court. Uh, like, there's a whole lot of names changing here. Um, gets a little hard to follow. 1892, death. Of the Duke of Clarence, January 14th, terrible calamity and loss of life in Trinity Bay on February 28th, the Great Fire in St. John's on the 8th and 9th of July. So good we named a beer after it. 1893, general election, Sir W. Whiteway's government uh, returned by a large majority in 1895. 1895. Hold <sighs> oh, waiting to get to that year. Uh, disability bill sanctioned by the Imperial... I don't care. Um... D.W. says right that I was like, I'm conscious of my sins of omission to commission. It's just all the stuff that he says that he's missed uh, in the book so far. Uh, basically saying what I said in the other episodes, he says here at this point, he's like, yeah, we're going to talk about St. Pierre, and we'll talk about Telegraph Communications, and we'll talk about Labrador. Um, in fact, he says St. Pierre is a funny little story, so I'm sure it won't be anywhere near funny at all. Um, okay, so now that we're out of the dates, uh, we find ourselves in the midst of political riots uh, that were... Originally believed to be made out uh, to be religious in origin, uh, but that wasn't really the case, uh, D.W. says. Uh, it says, many persons have imagined... So there was uh, election-based riots. Uh, no one was happy, so we were rioting. Uh, many persons have imagined that the frequent election rows in Newfoundland about this period were the outcome of religious bigotry. But a better understanding of the facts will show us that in the, this is an incorrect view. There is no real bigotry or sectarian intolerance in Newfoundland. 
All these riots were made to order. I think he meant at the time. Um, all these, so all these riots were uh, instigated. Uh, almost like a um, false flag type thing, I guess. Uh, Dr. Johnson has defined patriotism as the last refuge of a scoundrel. Sounds about right. Uh, the sham patriots who instigated their dupes to get up these disturbances often made religion as a stalking horse for their designs on the treasury. Uh, the blatant demagogues who cried out that the Catholic Church was in danger or that the sacred rights of Protestantism uh, were being trampled on, they always blew it out after a melee as fat officials. Um, so just cre uh, Greek, they were just pitting laws against each other uh, to further their political and financial gain. Uh, a few rowdies and bludgeon men, uh, instigated by these uh, designing rogues, a few rowdies and bludgeon men led the way, um, chick kickers, uh, and the simple crowd that followed were led to believe that their rights or their religion were in danger. Makes sense. Uh, in American political slang, this is known as bulldozing, um, or being a fucking arsehole. Um, okay, so lovely. So apparently the cat, yeah, okay, so we got that in 1843. Apparently at the time, uh, the Catholics were whooping Protestant ass in Conception Bay. The Protestants were whooping Catholic ass in Bay Roberts. And it all died off around 1861. Um, so there's a little bit of a, a switch up in the government here. Because again, it's all, um, the parties from 1855 to 1861 were heavily Catholic. And when, uh, basically what happened was in the middle of that, I, what I guess would be 68 or 57 sorry 57 58 they had the election the catholics took power again that's when the riots um sort of took place i guess and there was continued rioting and fucking around for a couple of years it looks like awesome um uh we got a guy pf little uh the able leader of the liberal party retired from politics in 18 oh man it's just so many fucking names i just i just don't care um, anyway, uh, Mr. B. Robertson and Mr. Little were appointed in places of the Supreme Court, and they were very capable, apparently. Um, God, why did this book have to be written by a judge? Why couldn't it have been written by anybody else? Um, so one of the most notable events of 1859 was the hotly contested election of that year, uh, so it was 59. Um, Buren was what the Americans call the pivotal district. I don't know why I keep saying what Americans would call it. Why not just call it what we would call it? Um, so yeah, so Buren was hotly protested. Again, you gotta remember at the time these elections were heavily based on whether you were English Christian or Roman Christian, I suppose. It's all stupid. Pepsi, Coke, pick a side. Stupid. Oh, God. Um, just so dumb. Uh, the Catholics were in power for like six years. Yeah, I just said that. They got voted out. Okay, so when they got voted out in 60... The Catholics got voted out in 61. And that's when, yeah, shit started to get really turned up around that point. Um, was not really a good time to be in. Um, just have a quick note here that um, the, the candidates in this, the hotly contested election, so there was... Uh, Mr. Hoyles and Mr. Evans were the conservative candidates, and the liberals were represented by one Andrew, Sh I think Andrew, A. Shea, and J.J. J. Rogerson. So, Hoyles and Evans are on conservative side, liberals are A. Shea and Rogerson. Okay? Um, basically, I'll just read it here. They were all well-matched opponents. Mr. Shea, now Sir Ambrose. Um, so, he goes by Sir Ambrose. As if there wasn't enough fucking names. Uh, he was the greatest politician of his party, one of the most able men in the colony, one of the most able men the colony has produced, and amongst his co-religionists, far away from the greatest of them all, uh, he had an opponent worthy of his steel in the conservative leader, Sir Hugh Hoyles. Um, what the contest cost has never been made public, purely when the election was undreamt, uh, whatever. Uh, liberals were credited with spending about £2,000. Mr. Hoyles paid for all his own expenses. So the Liberals spent £2,000. We don't really know how much anybody really spent. And the Conservatives paid for uh, their own shit. Uh, the contest was exceedingly close, but the tactics of Mr. Shea uh, on the Liberal side uh, and the intimidation of electors by the celebrated Cody, uh, who, by, yeah, at Flat Islands was also helped helped maternity the game today. Anyway, Liberals won. Um, the Liberals again carried the government. Uh, the Sir Honorable J. Kent was Premier and Colonial Secretary. J blah, blah, blah. A couple people were the speakers. 
Um, a new administration... The new administration was inferior in strength to Mr. Little's cabinet of a couple of years before. Uh, Mr. Kent, as premier, was uh, most honest and uh, a most honest and capable official, but his temper was uncertain. He never enjoyed the complete confidence of the Catholic Party and of the esteemed Dr. Mullock, um, like his predecessors were. Uh, the real leader was Mr. A. Shea. Um, though the sunshine and prosperity had risen upon them, it did not last. From 1860 to 1861, oh yeah, okay, then there were serious divisions in the party again. Everything's starting to fall apart. So they did, they had a strong leader, then they got in again, but they didn't have quite such a strong leader. And it goes like, there's I just, I could not be any less interested in the internal squabblings of the Liberal Party fucking 1860, right? I just, where's my, ah, drinking tonight, we're drinking uh, strawberry club soda, vodka, vodka, strawberry, strawberry vodka sodas. All you need is some vodka. And some strawberry soda, and you just mix that shit together as tightly as you'd like. Lovely. Um, okay. There have been divisions growing within the Catholic Party. I just said that. So, 1860, 1861, there's divisions in the Catholic Party. D. W. even goes so far as to use the term, began to fall to pieces. Ooh. Um, yeah, in 1860, the fisheries were shit, and, uh, they were actually so bad that the government instituted a program to subsidize the poor who were affected by the fishery, which is, like, kind of cool. Almost like what we're going through right now. Everything got shut the fuck down, there was no work, and we got a bit of help from the govy. Does It's not that foreign an idea. Apparently, we did it a hundred and... hundred and sixty years ago. Oh, man, math. Okay, moving on. Not gonna. I'm gonna try and pull out any more. How many years were between that date and that date again? Um, anyway, pretty cool. The government subsidized the poor in that move. I will give them credit for that. Uh, it's a cool move. Uh, so Bishop, at this point, um, there's some fucking anecdote about how Bishop Moloch and Justice Little, uh, they go to New York to try and sign a contract to commission a steamship to Newfoundland called the Victoria. Oh man, just look right at the book. Pick that word right off the page. Yo, oh, I'm getting so good at this. Um, so a serious conflict had arisen earlier in the year between Bishop Moloch and the administration, which called it the celebrated uh, letter given below, which I'm not going to read to you. Um, his lordship and Mr. Justice Little, on a visit to New York, had virtually made a contract with the owners of a steamer <laughs> called uh, steamer called the Victoria uh, to run this vessel twice a month, north and south. Um, an act had been passed gathering uh, 3,000 pounds sterling a year for local steam, and the bishop, uh, a most vigorous supporter of improved communications, both by steam and by telegraph, was terribly wroth when his own particular government refused to recognize his authority to commit them to a contract. When his lordship found that the government firmly refused to charter the Victoria, he denounced Mr. Kent's administration in a scathing epistle. Now, scathing. He was pissed. Um, yeah, and that's that's all they say about that. There's he, he, he just writes a letter getting pissed off. Because he's trying to get steam on the go. We're trying to get into the modern um, stage here. Uh, so we subsidize the poor Bishop Malik. Yeah, he goes, he gets pissed off. He's all going great. The government doesn't sign off on it. Drama! Um, okay, uh, the same year, this... Uh, the same year all this is happening, uh, Newfoundland is graced by uh, a visit from the Prince of Wales, and you wouldn't know this was a big fucking to-do. There's a picture of the young fella right there. Um, Prince of Wales, everybody. Prince of Wales here, just coming by the island for three days in July. Literally was here for three days in July. Um, like, the 22nd to the... Tw Ford, fuck you. Uh, the 22nd to the 25th of July in 1860... Um, apparently his visit was a complete success. He came here by way of the United States and Canada. I suppose we were, uh, on the way home. Makes sense. Um, anyway, uh, his visit was a complete success. The town was given up to festivity and rejoicing. The young heir apparent won all hearts by his grace and his courtesy. We did honor to our future sovereign by a grand ball, a regatta, a review, and the gift of a dog. Uh, uh, the dog from the breed of the celebrated Bat Sullivan. I don't know who the fuck Bat Sullivan is or what kind of dogs he had. I 
I hope it was a Newfoundland dog. Here's a Shih Tzu. Like, you know, um, so, uh, yeah, the Duke came. Um, literally, um, that was it. That's all we talked about. The Duke, uh, Duke, or fucking Prince, not the Duke, um, the Prince. The Prince showed up, and that was a big deal. Next. Um... The prince's governor, the popular, uh, blah, blah, blah. All went merry as a marriage bell during the three lovely summer days of the prince's stay amongst us. One and all did their best to make the auspicious occasion a truly joyous time. Our volunteer turnout and review was a great success. Fuck. Ah. Uh. No time for the royalty, see? Um, okay. There was another contested election or government and the House dissolved in 1861. So, that election of 1861 got hotly contested. Um, there was, it, it all, they all fucking, the House was immediately dissolved. There was, everyone was bitching and complaining. Mr. I see names like Mr. Kent, uh, government built. <laughs> Okay, a government, not, no, there was government bill. Um, uh, Mr. Cancer, Alexander Baer, government, oh, government bill. Um, <laughs> uh, Mr. Hoyles, anyway, they're all into it. None of them can agree. We can't establish a fucking reasonable government, um, <laughs> again. And, uh, there was no contest in Buren, no conflict or riot, uh, so Buren was cool this time, whereas Buren was the hotly contested part last time. Uh, this time it goes over, and now there's riots um, everywhere, pretty much except Buren. Uh, there's riots. Uh, there's uh, there was no contest in Buren, and no conflict or riot, except in the districts of Saint John's, Harbor Grace, and Harbor Maine. So, like the big ones. Um, the result completely changed the position of political parties. There was a serious disturbance in Harbor Maine between the rival Catholic candidates Hogsett and Fury on one side, with Nolan and Byrne on the other, uh, the attempt to invade Cat's Cove, now Conception Harbor, uh, with a strong harbor main contingent, caused terrible bitterness, the death of one man, and looting and destruction of property. After a protracted contest before the election committee, Nolan and Byrne were subsequently declared duly elected. On the 13th of May, 1861, the governor opened the new House of Assembly, his Excellency was hooted, and a violent mob surrounded the colonial building and attempted to break through the doors. Run-of-the-mill shit. Um, although I do like us... I, I do like the rioting part. I, I really do. We should do some rioting. Okay, anyway, I, didn't, I totally didn't say that to all the governments listening. Uh, they were ordered to withdraw from the assembly. Uh, they were, okay, so the, the guys, they, they beat on the doors of a colonial building. Um, they go in there, and anyway, they were ordered to withdraw from the assembly. They refused. Mr. Hogsett was then removed by the police, and Mr. Fury followed. Uh, later on the same day, there was a serious riot. In, the same day, there was a serious riot in St. John's. A mob broke onto the premises of uh, M-E-S-S-R-S. On the premises of Nolan and Kitchen, relatives of Mr. P. Nolan, the member of Harbor... Ma like, it's just... They, and, and his sister was related. Now, what she used to do around the bay... Like, I don't need to know the family tree of everyone that... Anyway, D.W. is just being thorough, as he has been for all these years. Anyway, the mob broke out. They're on Water Street. Um... People break into these They start dragging people out. The soldiers were ordered out. Colonel Grant and Judge Little and Father Jeremiah O'Donnell... Uh, did all in their power to calm the violence of the mob and to persuade them to retire. Uh, the magistrate read the riot act, literally read the riot act, which I love. Um, the riot act, but uh, to all to no purpose. Stones were thrown then at the military. An attempt was made to drag Colonel Grant from off of his horse. And finally, it is alleged a shot was fired at the soldiers. And reluctantly, you can't blame them. The commander was then compelled to give orders to fire. Three people were killed and 20 were wounded. Amongst the injured was the estimable Father O'Donnell, uh, for whom great sympathy was expressed among all classes. Uh, afterwards, I'm sure everyone felt like a proper fucking tool uh, for getting that man hurt. Uh, the whole trouble was due to the turbulence of the federal defeated candidate Hogsett and the violence of a few rowdies. Rowdies is a cool name. 
and the unfortunate riot for St. John's was the direct outcome of the Harbour Main election. For a time, it appeared like an organized attempt to make parliamentary government it was uh, going to be impossible, thanks to, however, the exertions of Bishop Moloch and his clergy and the general good sense of community and order. Um, and it was all completely restored. So we managed to get it back. This fucking guy, Moloch, man, he's pretty good. We should have given him a bigger street. Points if you know where Moloch Street is. Give you a hint. Georgetown. <laughs> Um, is it Georgetown? Yes. Um, okay. Now we talk about, uh, Sir Hugh Hoyles, uh, the leader of the new government. So Hugh Hoyles is the leader of the new government. And, uh, and we may say the whole administration rolled into one, I guess, because everything is such a clusterfuck. Uh, soon after 1861, when the angry passion of this evil time subsided, uh, he became not only the most respected, but the most popular man in the colony beloved by all classes. Good, someone we can like. Um, out of evil, sometimes comes good. The direct result of all of this rioting and violence, um, all this from all of the storm of violent partisanship and sectarian strife, was put to an end forever. Uh, was put to an end forever to religious ascendancy on both sides. That's a way of saying um, we put an end to it and we started getting along. Um, after a short recipe, it came uh, to. It became a settled rule in the formation of our government that all religious parties should be fairly represented in the arrangement of an administration and in the distribution of offices. As a direct result, sec sectarianism in policies, bigotry, and intolerance have year by year diminished. It's been a little bit of a kicking around, but it's good to see we were pretty good to see we were that progressive back then, really. Uh, the following year, 1862, will always be remembered as the spring of the Polinia and the Camper down. You know, those two famous boats that we all know the year 1862 for? You know, the Palima and the Camper Down? Fuck. Um, they were two they were two boats that were set out to uh go check out the whale or the seal fishery. Two Dundee whalers that were sent to prosecute the seal fishery. Okay? Uh, within the memory of man, there has never been such an ice blockade. For weeks and weeks, it blew a solid nor'easter, and uh, the sealing steamers did not take a single seal, and a lot of it was blown into Green Bay. Uh, blew wealth untold into Green Bay. Um, so that's good. I guess all the seals may have fucked off into Green Bay, because um, I guess there was the cod fishery this year was a partial, and the ship seal fishery almost a complete failure. This was in 1845. Oh, no, sorry. This is the worst season since 1845. Uh, the whole export of seal skins accounting only to 260,000, which I guess is a pittance of seals. How many fucking seals, right? That's a, that's a lot of seals when you think about it. I mean, really, when I mean, that's like, that's a bunch of fucking seals. Um, anyway, and you gotta go deal with all that death on the ice shit on top of it. Actually, look, here's a cool, there's a, a steamer called the Vanguard. Look, a picture of an old boat. Look at all the, look, boys, not a fucking drop of fall arrest to be seen. Not a harness, not a lanyard. Pop didn't care. Um, okay, so the early spring of the year. Uh, what year is it? Fucking, uh, I don't know. Uh, the early spring of this year was marked with a, with, a, with a terrible shipwreck of the SS Anglo-Saxon at Clam Cove on the 27th, accompanied with great loss of life. Cool, just good. Uh, the steamer Bloodhound belonging to Bain. Uh, what? The steamer Bloodhound belonging to Bain, Johnston & Company, commanded by the late Captain Alexander Graham, not Alexander Graham Bell, um, and the wolf belonging. Anyway, um, bunch of boats went out and they fucking failed. Um, 1,300 seals. Something shitty. Now, for no reason whatsoever, we're going to talk about water. So here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it in full because fuck this. A limited supply of water was provided for St. John's by the Water Company instituted in 1848. The flow was derived from George's Pond on Signal Hill and was found very beneficial. Later on, there was a demand for a larger and fuller supply. In 1863, the town was at length was at length furnished with an almost unlimited quantity of water from Windsor Lake uh, by the General Water Company. A uh, great blunder was made in the engineering by an official whom the company had distinctly refused to employ. Um, Sir A. Shea, remember him from a minute ago? Um, uh, and the other directors weakly gave way, and the works cost the colony about $120,000. Sounds like another fucking energy boondog utility boondoggle to me, not energy, water, hydro. Anyway, they're fucking around. Um, anyway, about... 
120,000 more than they should have done. However, we cannot grumble. The supply of pure water is simply invaluable, and, if properly managed, it offers a complete protection against fire. <laughs> uh, no town in the world has such a water supply as St. John's in proportion to its population. The natural pressure is sufficient to reach the highest points in the city. The supply is beautifully soft, clear, cool, and absolutely pure drinking water. Much of the success of the water company is due to the good management of our veteran sportsman, Mr. John Martin. Good fucking talk. Who cares? We got a water supply. You're supposed to. Um, okay, uh, during the... Uh, God, this book can't end soon enough. During the interval between the departure of Sir Alexander in 1863 and the arrival of Governor Musgrave in 1864, Honorable Lawrence O'Brien, President of the Council, administered the government with dignity and efficiency. Well, isn't that... You're, again, you're supposed to... Okay. Government's doing governmenty things. No one really respected Sir Anthony. Sir Hugh Hoyle's health had so completely failed, he was no longer able to bear the heavy burden of his office. He had literally worked himself to death's door. In 1865, he became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, a position competent of case. As lawyer Sir, Sir Hugh was unrivaled, he made a modest judge, the most reigning I'm not. The leadership of the party naturally fell on the shoulders of the present Chief Justice. In the election of 1865, Sir Frederick's government was sustained by a large majority. Now, we're, I don't know how many fucking governments we've gone through this one episode, but just for anybody keeping score at home, we started with somebody, and now we're at Sir Frederick in 1865. Frederick, it might not even be, like, Sir Ambrose wasn't even that guy's name. This guy might be, like, named Dave. Now I'm Sir Fred. Um... The great political movement of the time was the Confederation of British North America. To complete the Union, our island was necessarily included in the scheme. Sir Frederick and Sir Ambrose Shea, always oh, Ambrose, not Andrew, Ambrose, uh, were sent out as delegates to the Great Confederation Conference and returned with a draft of the terms on which we might become united with the Dominion. And with that... It is my great pleasure to tell you, that takes us to page 495, I can stop doing this, and conclude episode 28 of Liam Small of Bridges, A History of Newfoundland by D.W. Prowse, 15 to 20 pages at a time, every day or every other day, depending on how I'm feeling, until the bars reopen, if they ever do. Um, hopefully, guys, we'll get down to uh, uh, phase four, bubble four, I don't know, what, what do we call it? Uh, stage four? Um... Uh, usually people don't look forward to, to stage four, but I guess when you're in stage five, stage four starts looking pretty good. Uh, get your bubble on, guys. Um, this has been a real pleasure. Just, God, I live for this shit. Hey, guys, thanks uh, for listening, watching. Um, thank you to people who send me in minor corrections, uh, things like that. Mostly, uh, a lot of it's got to do with my uploading to Facebook. Facebook is real fickle and weird sometimes. Um, and I, I kind of have to upload them separately because the one time I tried to upload to Instagram from my desktop, it, it made the video fucking upside down for no reason. So I got to chop them up into threes on my phone and I got to uh, do it uh, on Facebook on my desktop because I can't do it on my laptop. Because uh, Anyway, there's been some issues. Um, so pardon some of the delays. It's not just because I don't want to do this. Don't get me wrong. I don't. But uh, some of the delays have been more technical um, and dehydrated in nature than uh, than me just not doing this. Anyhow, with that said, guys, have a lovely night. Stay safe. Keep up uh, the good work with all of our health and uh, uh, paranoia and uh, fear. And uh, that's not so bad. It's we're, we're getting used to. It was pretty cute for the first couple of weeks. It sucks now, but we're we're getting there. Hey, who wants to learn how to golf? Am I right? Okay, see you guys. <laughs>